forward to it. Thank you, Mike and, uh, and Alina and Philip for the, the invitation. Very nice to participate in this uh, interesting international seminar. So I'm going to be talking about value sets of sparse polynomials. Uh, here's the abstract I, I gave. So we're going to be looking at the, the size of a set like this. So is the values of a, that a polynomial take. So polynomial with coefficients in a finite field. Uh, and you look at the set of values and want to estimate it from below. So make sure that it's big. Um, and uh, the, interest, the, the different thing from, you know, this is a problem that's been worked on a lot. The different thing that we're going to be talking about today is that it's going to be look, we'll be looking at sparse polynomials. And I'm going to define that in a moment. Uh, before I get on to, the, to this, let me just say an important thing that this is all joint work with Igor Spalinski. There in the photo. It's a photo from 2007 in Tahiti. Don't know if we're going to be going there again anytime soon, but there you go. Okay, so value sets. So what I'm going to do is uh, what uh, we tell our students not to do in an algebra class, which is to think of a polynomial as a function. We'll Usually, you know, if you a polynomial is a polynomial ring, and you especially over finite fields, you don't want to think of it as a function because you don't want to identify two polynomials that give the same function. But here, in this talk, yes, I'm going to think of a polynomial as a function, and therefore it has a a, a range, an image, and we want to measure the size of this image. So, v of f for us will be the cardinality of the image of f, of fq under f, okay? And if your polynomial has degree n, then this polynomial is at most n to 1. So every element of fq has at most n free images. So you can get the lower bound, uh, the q over n rounded up. So you have a, lo a, 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 a lower bound. It depends on the degree. If the degree is small, this is quite a good lower bound. If the degree is big, it could, you know, it, it could be meaningless, right? If the degree is more than q minus one over two, then q over two, then the, the, this bound doesn't tell you anything. And in fact, this bound is attained if you have n dividing q minus one and you take your polynomial to be x to the n. Then, you know, so this is organized to be n, n to one, right? Except at zero. And uh, so this lower bound is attained. Uh, so this is this is an old uh, observation. Uh, this is in this paper, Kalitz, Lewis, Mills, and Strauss. Uh, and they show that as the, if Q is prime, then uh, this polynomial is essentially up to, you know, you can change the variable, change the x, so pre-compose or post-compose with a linear map and, or a fine map, and you get the same thing, but up to, to these obvious transformations, these polynomials are the only ones that attain the lower bound for Q prime. And uh, Callis, Lewis, Mills, and Strauss also uh, classify those polynomials over Fp squared, that attain this lower bound. So there are a few more. That is not just those power maps, but there are a few more polynomials that attain this lower bound. Uh, this was recently extended by Bosch and Reyes, who, who did the case of P cubed. So they classify the polynomials that, that are, these are called minimal value polynomials that attain this lower bound here. Okay, so this is, uh, you know, there's lots of, papers on this, and but this is still an ongoing uh, area of research. People are still working on this to, to understand how this how good is this bound uh, in terms of the, of the degree and uh, whether it can be improved and what, what are the cases where you, you get equality. But we want to look at a slightly different problem. We want to look at the polynomial that is sparse, so sparse polynomial. So sparse, you know, I guess it's uh, 
is in the eye of the beholder. But what, what I want to do is I want to look at the polynomial of this shape. So it has t terms, or well, there's a constant term, but the constant term doesn't matter. Uh, so there's t non-constant terms. And I want to estimate the number, of, so v of f, remember, is the cardinality of the image. And I want to estimate v of f in terms of the number of terms and q. So q has to be in there. And, but I want to find estimates that depend on the number of terms and not on the degree. So the, the exponents are going to allow them to be anything, uh, I mean, uh, up, to, up to q, right? Because, you know, x to the q is x. So remember, we're thinking of polynomials as functions. So x to the q is equal to x. So if you go beyond q, you can go back down. So we want to look at polynomials like that. And we want to estimate the, this number from below. But uh, in terms of the number of terms, and perhaps it's slightly surprising that we can do that. Uh, well, we have to be careful because remember the polynomial x to the n uh, had uh, very few images if n is, uh, divides q minus 1 and is big. And you can uh, say, uh, some, do something like this, right? So now this is a polynomial of, you know, a binomial and still has small image if n divides q minus 1. So we're going to have to exclude polynomials for which all the exponents are multiples of, of some n. But hopefully if we exclude those, then we, we hope that we can get something. And, and uh, so here's the theorem that we can prove. Uh, so those two conditions here are to avoid the, the exponents all being divisible by the same thing or the difference between all the exponents being divisible by the same thing. There's some, a few cases that uh, we have to exclude. So, the, you know, it doesn't really matter what they, the, 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 the hypothesis say. Uh, I think this hypothesis may be, an, uh, could be weakened. It's, it, it was a little bit of a, an effort to find a, a set of hypotheses that did everything that we wanted to do and could be sort of stated you know, in a more or less clean way. And that's where we arrived at. But, you know, it's just it, it's not, not very important to, 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 to look at, at exactly what the hypothesis says, but that the hypothesis are there to avoid all the exponents being divisible with the same thing and, and with something that, so certainly this condition is satisfied, right? All the exponents and be divisible with the same thing, which will also divide p minus one. This would be a bad case. So if you have a polynomial, we, with those exponents, so this is a condition, and the coefficients, there's no condition on the coefficients. So it's a polynomial with t terms, and we get a lower bound for the image. Uh, so the, the, the first term of this lower, so the important thing is this second term here. So the first term is just to avoid a few special cases when t is small, and, 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 and let me just rewrite what's, what's, what is the, the important part of this. Okay, so that's, that's essentially the, 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 the main term of the bound. It's p over 4, p to the power 4 over 3t. So it gets worse as t gets bigger, as you might expect. But if you fix t, then you, you get a lower bound that depends only in t and in p under those hypotheses here. And, uh, and they're very important. This is only for prime fields. So uh, I'll show you in a moment an example why we need prime fields, uh, if, you, if you don't have prime fields, this bound is not true. Okay, so that's, that's, what, that's what the theorem says. That, that under some reasonable hypothesis, the number of, of values of a polynomial with t terms is at, is at least this many. Uh, when, when t is two, we have a slightly different argument, even more elementary that uh, gives a lower bound, which is a little better, is the uh, view of f is at least, is at most, is at least the square root of p. So for binomials, we can do a little better with an elementary argument. So that's nice. But for, for arbitrary t, what best we can do is, is, is this. Uh, let me show you a couple of examples. So uh, for, the first example is what I what I told you, right? So if you if you have x n k one plus x n k two plus etc., then 
of course, you're going to get, you even get an upper bound, right? Because this polynomial is going to be n to 1 if n divides minus 1. So if you make n big, right? So if you have something like x to the p minus 1 over 6 plus x to the p minus 1 over 3, that, that will have six images, or seven images. So it's going to be, so you, you need the, the hypothesis on, on the exponents. And uh, another example is the, the trace map. So this, this, this polynomial uh, represents the trace from fp to the t to fp. So the values are in fp, right? So it maps all fp to the t to, f, to fp. It has t terms. And, and, and so p to the t is q. And v of f, I'm going to write it like this, is uh, q to the 1 over t. Right, so this is an example of a polynomial with t terms, so which the image is uh, the size of the image is q to the one over t, and 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 if you go back here, the the exponent is uh, four four over three t, so which is a little bigger. So four over three t is a little bigger than one over t. So you see that, you know, this can be achieved when we're talking about prime fields, but if you go to fields of uh, Characteristic p, which which are not prime, finite fields that are not prime fields, then 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 this is the best you can hope for, q to the one over g. Okay. All right. So let me. Uh, I'm going to tell you about the proof. The proof has three main steps, and each of these steps illustrates an interesting technique. So I think one one of the nice things about this, this, this problem is that we use some nice techniques that are applicable in other circumstances. At the end, I might, if I have time, I'll mention a different kind of problem over finite fields that we use the same techniques. And, uh, I, and I also want to point out that there's a lot of scope for improvement. So I, I'm also hoping that somebody is going to Look at these problems and 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 say, hey, maybe I could improve this bound or that bound and, and get something a little better. Okay, so let's see how the the the, the proof goes. So the first thing is, you know, as I said in the beginning, I'm going to have a polynomial with arbitrary degrees, just so it has only t terms, but the degrees of the terms can be anything you like. But I'm going to use a trick to reduce the degree. And the trick is as follows. You, you replace x by x to the m, where m is prime with p minus 1. So x goes to x to the m is a bijection on fp. So replacing x by x to the m doesn't change the image of the polynomial. So you compose f with, with, with a bijection, you get another map with the same size of image. Right? Again, we, we're thinking of polynomials uh, as functions. The algebraist may, may feel a bit annoyed, but that's what we're going to do in this talk. Uh, so what happens with the exponent? So doing this replacement doesn't change the number of terms, right? So if you're replacing x by x to the m, you, each monomial gets replaced by a different monomial, but it's still a monomial. So if the polynomial has t monomials, the new polynomial also has t monomials, but the exponent gets changed by this. You get multiplied by m, but then you can reduce it mod p minus 1 just using the fact that x to the p is equal to x. So you can reduce the, po the m and i by, re re replace an i by m and i mod p minus 1. And, and that's where I, we use those two hypotheses on the exponents in, in the statement of the theorem. You use the hypo this hypothesis in the pigeonhole argument to show that for some choice of m, all these numbers are going to be small. How small? Something like p to the 1 minus 1 over t. Oops. Something like this. I don't want to go into the details of the computations. That's going to detract from, from the, the ideas. The, the point is, you know, you, 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 you make this, this change of variables, and then you change the exponents, and then you can make a choice of the change of variables that make all the exponents a little bit smaller, OK? And so you know, if you have a polynomial of a certain degree, say this degree, 
then the number of solutions of an equation like that is at most this, right? So you can, you, you can already use this to get a lower bound for the cardinality of the image. And you get something like this. You get P to the one over T. So you, you, you get a, a, an upper bound for the number of solutions of this equation, a, number of, a upper bound for the number of pre-images of a given element of F P, and therefore you get a lower bound for the cardinality of F P. And this is in a paper of these many authors. I'm not going to read them all, all the names. Uh, and this paper, so it has, this argument is there, and also a number of applications of sparse polynomials to cryptography and so on. So uh, if you want some motivations for looking at this type of polynomials, this is a good paper to look at. You know, they, they, they consider this, this type of polynomials and, and, and prove this kind of results with, with a, a number of applications in mind. Uh, so remember, we want to get to p to the 4 over 3t, so we want to do better. We want to do better than this. But we, we, we will need the polynomial to have a slightly smaller degree. So we start by doing this, and then we continue with this new polynomial that has a slightly smaller degree. And uh, look at that. So what are we going to do? Um, if uh, this set is small. The cardinality of the set is small. It means that the, 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 there are many, many uh, values taking and many elements of FP taking the same value. So if you have A and B taking F of A is equal to F of B, then it's a root of this polynomial into variables, right? So two polynomials that have the same image gives you a solution to this equation. So what we're going to do is, you know, we're going to argue by contradiction, we want to get the lower bound for this number. If we assume it's very small, it means that this uh, equation into variables has lots of solutions. Okay, so now we can, we can bring in some uh, other tools. Uh, one tool that you can bring in is, is, is the Hasse-V bound. The Hasse-V bound tells you uh, a reasonably good estimate for the number of solutions of, a, of a, an equation into variables of a finite field. So number of points on curves of a finite field, that's what we're going to be looking at. Except the way bound applies to irreducible curves. So one, one issue that we have in applying the, the way bound directly to this equation is that this equation is not irreducible, right? So uh, uh, this equation, f of x minus f of y, is divisible by x minus y, right? So certainly has one factor, and it can have many other factors. So to apply the Weyer bound, or to apply any other bound, so for example, a long time ago with Stor, I, I, I developed a, a different approach to bounding the number of points of curves of finite fields, which is, uh, gives better results than the Weyer bound for high degree, and we're actually gonna need these results in, 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 to, to get our estimate. So we, we're going to try and factor this polynomial, f of x minus f of y, and it may have some factors of large degree, and we have to deal with that. In fact, you know, the typical situation will be when uh, f of x minus f of y over x minus y, so that's going to be the ideal situation, right? So that's what you kind of expect. when. This is irreducible. Then, then you need to deal with the number of points of, of, of solutions of an equation of large degree. And then the Hasse-V bound is not, not so, so useful. And again, you know, it's, uh, this, uh, this uh, talk is, uh, is also, a, 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 I'm trying to incentivize people to look at these problems again. Uh, uh, I think there's lots of work to be done on, on, on bounding, finding upper bounds for the number of solutions of equations of finite fields when the degree is large, when the way bound is not, not, um, not used. So for each irreducible factor of this, this, this polynomial, we're going to apply some bound, and, 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 and that sort of leads the, the, the way to, to, to proving our theorem. The, the thing that is missing, the, which is the next step, 
is how many factors does this polynomial have? Can it, can it factor as a product of lines, for example? That would be horrible, right? So if this polynomial f of x minus f of y was a product of linear polynomials, this, uh, this whole thing would collapse. And, 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 and this proof will not, will not go through. So we want to avoid uh, this. We want to find, uh, you know, discover, you know, how many factors does it have? You know, it could have a few factors, but, you know, hopefully they are, I mean, the degree of this polynomial is, com uh, is large, right? So, so if, 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 if it has few factors, the, the factors will have to have large degree. You might have a few factors of small degree, few factors of large degree, but we have to control the number of factors of this polynomial. So that's uh, our next, next step, is to control the number of factors of this polynomial. Here's a blank page. I was hoping to, to use it to, to write stuff in. I, may, I might come back and, and, and write stuff in on it. Let's skip it. OK, so okay. So remember, g of x, y is a factor. Or maybe I'll go back one step. Yeah. So uh, Zanier looked at the following problem. Uh, he, he looked at the polynomial f of x, which was sparse. And there was an old question, I think, of Shinzo. This is all in characteristic zero, whether a sparse polynomial could be of the form g of h of x. So could f of x be a composition of two polynomials? So this was a question of Shinzo that uh, Zanier resolved. And the, his observation was, well, if, if this is true, so if this is true, then uh, h of x minus h of y divides f of x minus f of y. So a polynomial that is a composition, so just using the fact that a polynomial is a composition, uh, if you have a polynomial in one variable that is a composition of two polynomials, then the, this polynomial in two variables, f of x minus f of y, has factors. And his uh, idea was, how do I prevent that? How do I prove that a polynomial like, like this, f of x minus f of y, has factors of small degree? And his idea was to use, was to look at as a factor, so g is a factor. So g is a g of x. Uh, so g x y is a factor of f of x minus f of y. Okay. So I want to consider a hypothetical factor of 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 f of x minus f of y. I want to uh, irreducible, and I want to look at the, the the curve defined by this equation and call k the function field of this curve. And then, because uh, g of x, y divides f of x minus f of y, and f is my sparse polynomial, I get this identity in this function field k. So x and y are elements of k, are functions on, 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 on this curve. So they are elements of k. So you get an equation involving powers of x and y holding in k. And this is a S unit equation. So number theorists are very familiar, people who deal with alpha 10 equations, especially, are very familiar with S unit equations. It's a well-known technique in, in number theory to reduce many alpha 10 equations to the S unit equation. Uh, this is an S unit equation. So. Uh, What's that S unit equation is a, is, a, is a sum of, of elements of a field where the zeros and poles of these elements are, are, are constrained to a set. So S is a set of, of places of K. So S is a set of places of K. Okay, so S unit equation is a sum of terms all whose uh, zeros and poles are constrained to be in S. And because in, in, in this equation, all the terms are powers of X and Y, the zeros and poles of all the terms in this equation are zeros and poles of X and Y. Right? 
the zeros and poles of x squared or x cubed or x to the seventh are the same as the zeros and poles of x with different multiplicities, of course, but the same zeros and poles. And, and how many zeros and poles are there? So x and y have, uh, so it's a, if this curve has some degree d, the x has d zeros, right? Because x equals zero is a line. Uh, there are d points at infinity, and y also has d zeros. So both x and y will have uh, poles at this d points at infinity, and they'll have each have d zeros. So s is well, it could there could be fewer, but uh, it certainly is the most three d. So if if, if the, this curve has degree d, the the set s is the most three d. So this is what what Zanier did for composition of sparse polynomials. This is what we want to do with uh, uh, counting points of, of, of equations like that where f of x or f of x is a sparse polynomial. And we're gonna use uh, 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 old results of Branwell, Masser, and myself, uh, which uh, gives generalized ABC bound. So the, the unit equation when it has three terms is, uh, is A plus B equals C, is, is the same kind of question as the ABC conjecture. Uh, here we're going to have more cement, so it's a generalized ABC bound. And uh, in characteristic zero, many, many years ago, uh, uh, well, starting with, with, with um, Guy who first formulated the ABC for functional design, but his name escaped me. Somebody remembers the can I mute to tell me? Uh, Masser and Osterle? No, before. Mason and Stothers? Mason, Mason, thank you. Yeah, Stothers. Richard Mason uh, was the, you know, started this, formulated the, the function field ABC, proved it. He proved some, some weak form of the ABC with arbitrary many, many summands, and then Brown, Master, and myself uh, proved the result, which uh, uh, the, which the statement would be more or less on the same slide. Next slide, uh, giving a bound for, for, in the case of function field of characteristic zero with arbitrary many summands. But here, for, for, for our application, we need characteristic P. So uh, here is a statement. So this is a statement. So the, if we have a function field of genus G and characteristic P, finite set of places, this is a unit equation, S unit equation. So the UIs are S units. And you get this bound for the degrees of the UI. So this is the, this is exactly the old bound of uh, Brano, Masser, and Voller uh, from, from the 80s, uh, except in characteristic zero, you don't need an additional condition. In characteristic P, you need this condition here. So this bound is not true for all the units, only the units that, that uh, so here, this, this degree is, you, you think of you, this, this n tuple giving you a map from, so K is the function field of some curve, and this, this, this n tuple here gives a map to P m minus one, and this degree is the degree of this map. And so assuming this bound on the degree, you can carry on a similar argument as this old argument and prove a bound like this. So, and here's the point where I need prime fields. So if you've been wondering where the prime fields come in is exactly here. So uh, this, 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 this argument will break down over non-prime fields those are the bound for the, the size of the image of a sparse polynomial because we need to use this theorem and this theorem has this restriction that these functions have to have degree less than p. And, and so, but if, when we can use this restriction, then you get a bound for the, this. And, and notice that this, the genus come in here and, and, uh, and also, so, so if, you, if you go back here, so the genus will come in and the, 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 the size of the set of places S is controlled by the degree. So what's going to happen is that the theorem that is on the next slide 
prevents an equation like this to have a solution if the genus or the G are small enough. So if this, this factor exists, it has to have large degree. It has to have large degree and large genes because uh, otherwise uh, the, the ABC bound will be violated. So uh, the idea of the proof is that we, we, we look at an arbitrary factor of this guy and we show that its degree has to be large because if the degree were small, you'd get a, 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 a solution to the unit equation, this solution to the unit equation. And this theorem prevents you from having a solution to the unit equation. Okay, so that's the, these are the, the three main ideas that go into the proof of the theorem. So uh, one is to reduce the degree of the, of the polynomial by, by making a change of variables x goes to x to the m. The second is to, well, maybe you could think of it. The second is this one that we show that f of x minus f of y has, well, no, the second one would be to look at f of x minus f of y and say we want f of x minus f of y to have few factors so that we can bound with, with the known techniques the number of solutions to the equation f of f of x minus f of y. And then the third part is to bound the number of factors by using the unit equation. Okay, so that's 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 the sketch of the, the proof of the theorem. Of course, you know, getting all the bounds right takes a little bit of messing around with all the, the different uh, ranges and breaking things up. Okay, I want to give another application of the same ideas, which is to exponential sums. So, uh, so this is a different problem, all, again, over finite fields. And but the, it turns out that essentially the same ideas, the same techniques, lead to bounds to these exponential sums. And uh, so how do we do this? Uh, so so what's what's the statement of the result? We have a prime and an integer n now that will divide that uh, divide the prime, and we look at exponential sums like this. So e to the two pi i a x plus b x to the n over p, where x varies in the integers mod p. And we can prove that this is a most uh, a constant times e to the fourth x. And uh, this, this is a type of uh, uh, question that has been looked at uh, a lot in the past. Uh, uh, members of the Russian School of Analytic Number Theory looked at this kind of bounds. And we've managed to get uh, an improved bound on this kind of exponential sums. Uh, how do we do this? Well, so first of all, we have to reduce this to, to, to counting solutions of equations of the finite fields. And one way to do that is to, to look at the, the fourth power of the left, left hand side. And when you expand it, you end up with uh, you know, things like uh, ax plus bx to the n minus, yeah, by, so ax minus ay plus bx to the n, something like that. And, and there is a, 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 a nice technique that goes back to Mordell, I think, which is to average. So you take the fourth power of one of these and you now vary A and B and look, the, one of these guys is a member, is a sum and a big sum. And if you set things right, you, you, know, you use the fact that many sum ends will repeat you get that uh, if one term is very big, then the sum is all very big. So there's some waste there that you, you're trying to bound one element, one, one, one uh, exponential sum. You put this one exponential sum in a family and you bound the fourth power of all, the, the sum of the fourth powers of all the members of the family. And then if you can bound the, 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 the sum of the fourth powers of all the members of the family, you bound this fourth power of each member of the family. And so we, 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 we reduce to, 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 to looking at, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the number of solutions of this kind of equation. So again, this is a, 
a unit equation, right? So if you if you if you want, you want to count the number of solutions, so I'm getting ahead of myself. You want to count the number of solutions of this equation. So the first thing you have to do is count the number of factors. So how does this polynomial x to the n plus y to the n minus x plus y minus one to the n minus one? How does this polynomial factor? The number of factors of the polynomial will influence the number of solutions of this equation. So the first thing I need to do is count the number of factors. And once I counted the number of factors, then I can again bound the number of solutions uh, using the standard techniques. So, and again, to bound the number of factors of this polynomial, I, 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 I look at this polynomial and say, this is a unit equation in four variables, four semantics, right? And, 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 the, and the zeros and poles Right, are, are in the zeros and poles of x and y, and x plus y plus one. But these are three lines, right? So, so the the s is going to be bounded by four d. Right, so g of x y is a factor of degree d of that equation. Then we're looking at a unit equation where the set of zeros and poles is at most four d. But this equation is very special, and, 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 and one thing that we looked at is, so how does this factor? So we can prove a theorem. We can prove that the number of factors is small, that each factor has large degree, uh, except there are some, some, some so trivial factors. So this, this polynomial is symmetrical. So it, it sort of has a few factors that come in that you can't avoid, x minus 1, y minus 1. And x plus y, x plus y only happens when, when I think when n is odd. Anyway, the, it's only for one, one of these two cases the x plus y will occur, but it will definitely occur. So this, this, this uh, polynomial, how does it factor? And we did some experiments, and, 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 uh, and then uh, Popovich did some more experiments when he saw a preprint of our paper. And what it turns out is that other than these three trivial factors that well, two of them do occur and the third might occur, the polynomial is irreducible. Except for one case. So there's a little surprise there. When n is p plus 1 over 2, this polynomial factors as a product of linears and quadratics. Is something you can prove. It's not too difficult, a little exercise. But other than that, this polynomial appears, I mean, once you re remove this either two or three trivial factors, it appears to be irreducible. And Popovich uh, uh, checked this for p less than 200. Uh, there is one case where it can actually prove that it's the, 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 the relevant polynomial is irreducible, the case p minus 1 over 2. So Borges, Cook, and Coutinho proved this. So this is in one this one uh, exponent, the conjecture is true. But you know the, the the experimental evidence is for this conjecture that as long as you exclude the case p plus one over two, this polynomial has a couple of trivial factors, and then the rest is irreducible. That would be that that potentially will improve the this bound. And have you know understanding how this polynomials factor uh, will improve this bound and some other bounds. So uh, we we don't have a good uh, I mean other than this appeal to the ABC conjecture, which is quite crude. We don't have a very fine uh, understanding of how this polynomials factor. So uh, you know this is a conjecture. I have no idea. I, I you know I don't really know even those two cases that. We, we know the answer. I don't really know why. But, um, you know, I think, I mean, it's pretty clear that that's what's happening for this polynomial. I wouldn't expect, I don't know, but I, I don't think there'll be surprises for larger ends. So, yeah, so understanding how this polynomial factors is, 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 um, is an interesting challenge. And, and in general, uh, the, 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 how does f of x minus f of y, where f is sparse? How does do this factor? And, and you know, I don't really have a a conjecture. You know, so the, the the natural guess is to say, well, 
typically it's going to be reducible except for a few trivial factors but uh you know why would that be the case i don't really know that would have also implications for this conjecture of of of, of um Shinzo that uh, Zanier worked on. So, which I think it essentially, I mean, they think the original conjecture is essentially solved, but uh, there might be some uh, extensions or other, other similar things that one might look at. You know. I mean, it always depends on. on, 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 on. So, sparse is, is, is a sort of a, not a well defined term, right? So, sparse means it has t terms, but t is small. But what does small mean? It's up to the individual mathematician working on the problem to decide. Okay, so that's that's pretty much what I want to say. So uh, thank you for your attention, and uh, I'd be happy to answer questions.